Facebook Live. And Good. So, uh, Professor Tootle, really? Um, okay, let me let me just premise this. Uh, I just got off the Colorado Trail, and for folks that haven't been in Colorado, to know the beauty uh, of, um, on Kenosha Pass, heading over Georgia Pass, over near Breckenridge, I look like hell. Forgive me, I truly just drove back. And so I'm kind of in this Colorado mindset of seeing God's green graces and beautiful vistas and through hikers. And, and the next thing I got to stop all that and talk to a full PhD professor on Americans foreign policy. So if I'm a little bit flippant today, it's because I'd still probably rather be out on the trail. So welcome. Uh, that was my introduction, you all. Uh, John Brackney from the Colorado Trail. Uh, professor Tootle, uh, can you give something more noble about your background or do you want to be fun and flippant on, uh, as an intro for this one? I was just going to say, I just, as I was telling you right before we fired up, I got on my motorcycle yesterday at 6 a.m. and I got home at 9.30. So you think you're feeling rough. I mean, I'm showered and all of that, but I, I just, I had a lot of saddle time yesterday. So <laughs> let's talk, I just uh, let's talk foreign policy. Uh, okay, I, I just don't know how somebody you know i don't know how somebody can ride that long without being like sore or stiff or tired or i am i am sore stiff and tired yeah. <laughs> okay well um folks if you need to know professor tootle he has a uh, uh, just really an exquisite uh, resume uh, to be talking about this kind of stuff so just google him believe me um he's uh, worthy of your time uh, so professor foreign policy Here's an easy puffball question that I, I'd like you to answer seriously, even though we've talked about this before. What does America stand for in an era of 19, 1776 to 1787, the 11 years, uh, we did the Articles of Confederation a year after 1776, and that didn't quite work out, but it took 10 years to find it, didn't work out. Did America in foreign policy, did America stand for something, uh, who we are and what do we, what do we want the world to think of us and how we want the world to engage with us in our founding first 11 years? That's your first question. And if we take five or 10 minutes to talk about this, I think that's more important than talking about some other stuff. So that's your big, big question to begin with. Okay. Well, the, the, the big answer is the, the, the two longest American foreign policy traditions are unilateralism and American exceptionalism. And we'll start with American exceptionalism first. It doesn't mean that America is better than every place else. What it means is that the first foreign policy obligation we have is for the preservation of representative institutions at home. So um, it doesn't mean America is better than everybody else. It just means that we have a special role to play in the world to prove that representative government works. And so um, understanding that, uh, and then the second term I use, unilateralism, kind of flows from the first, the, um, because we have a special role to play in the world, that means that we, we have to be prepared sometimes to act alone in cases where our interests don't coincide with any other country because no other country has the same duty to preserve representative government that we have. So um, it means that we should, we should uh, sorry, somebody needs to mute themselves. I'm getting a, is it? Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, American exceptionalism, preserve representative institutions at home is the most important thing that we do as a country and that means that we have to make decisions in foreign policy in order to preserve representative government at home. And that also means we sometimes have to be prepared to act alone because no other country on earth has that same duty or responsibility. Okay, so, so that was a similar answer to what I would expect you to give and I applaud it, but, but flush it out with a little bit more context. Uh, it, it, without having a political science degree and a law degree and knowing you well and spending a career in this. To me, when I talk to some of my friends and, and other friends around the world, they might think that's an arrogance. They might think that, that well, wait, our country's special too. And what do you mean you have an, a sole role and you have the ability to act unilaterally? Well, so do we. I mean, so what is, 
flush out the difference of maybe the history of humanity versus the founding of our country. Um, and why are we so unique in that role of um, exceptionalism and unilateralism? Well, I mean, I guess I would say to a, a, somebody in another country, every country has a different reason why it exists, a political, diplomatic, military, social, cultural, whatever it is, nation just means people, state means government. And I mean, even the idea that a nation and a state would be the same thing is a relatively modern idea. Um, and, the, and the fact that the United States was the first ideological nation state, uh, uh, meaning we're a people and a government and the, the, who the people are is defined by a set of ideals, that's all unique. And so at the time of our founding, we were the only ones. And that means that every other government on earth had an interest in our failure. And we were incredibly weak. I, I think the other thing that is often um, misunderstood about American exceptionalism is you would that somehow, if you think that it's something that comes out of pride or arrogance, uh, no. The, it, I mean, Hamilton was the one who was saying, we have to negotiate with the British and give in to their demands because we're 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 simply too weak. We don't we are we have to have, um, and he was uh, he was brilliant in this sense because um, what he did was he m made countries who were hostile to our existence invested in our success. And if you can get your enemies to want you to succeed, you're a genius. <laughs> and. So, I mean, that's why Hamilton is sometimes considered like the, the singular genius of the revolution because he could do stuff like that. And, um, uh, and he's the person who's most responsible for shaping American exceptionalism in those early days of getting our government to actually work. But it was because we were so weak. I mean, under the Articles of Confederation, I don't think you know, people really understand how complete the failure was. Um, the British were still occupying forts. The French were still occupying forts. Native Americans were still occupying forts and they weren't leaving. And, the, and we had no control over our own currency. We, and, and so our economy was inflating and crashing and uh, subject to manipulation from foreign actors. And it meant that we couldn't engage in trade because nobody knew how much our money was worth. And it, uh, we couldn't protect our own people <laughs> um, in any part of the country. And I mean, if the failure of the Articles of Confederation was complete. And um, so it was a policy born out of weakness than much more so than strength. Okay. Um, flush it out one more, for, one more time for me, then I'll move to the next question. Founding in 1776 off a noble declaration of independence with a bunch of grievances against the king. And then some trouble because we didn't have a, enough powerful national government. All sorts of problems that you just articulated. So then we form a constitution. And that constitution told the world what? What, what does America stand for in 1787? What, what did that mean to the world? We are a blank. And we, now we're talking, this policy, this discussion is about foreign policy, and we'd like you to also be blank or just don't mess with us blank or right. what? In a way, it wasn't so much the ratification of the constitution because every country has, a, you know, some sort of plan, but what, what really was the, the signal to other countries was the success of the constitution in the years after ratification. So the first important test was when um, Washington left office. That was pr probably the, the most important early signal to the rest of the world. Well, actually, I guess I would rank them this way. First of all, us paying off our debts at face value. Uh, and we became the safest place for investment in the world, safer than any old European country, uh, because we were one of the few people who had a, we were probably one of the, I'd have to think about this, but we might have been the only country that was ruled by rule of law that wasn't subject to the whims of a king uh, during those decades. So in, investment capital just flooded to the United States during those years. But then the, the a further signal to that was that when Washington left, the next signal was when Jefferson didn't kill all of his um, political enemies, meaning 
he fired most of the Federalists, but he didn't fire all of them and he didn't kill any of them. And that this was astonishing to, to, to the rest of the world. So, um, and then the Federalists recognizing the legitimacy of, um, uh, of Jefferson's election would be another. Uh, so, so all of these early, you know, the um, establishment of judicial review, all of these things taken together are a signal that the United States is actually going to succeed. And what we really see is that by the 1820s, we are a wealthy enough country and considered stable enough that the, the larger powers in the world uh, were willing to deal with us and assumed that we would keep our word in foreign policy. So really, you know, and, and the biggest signal of that is probably the changing relationship between the United States and Britain after the war, in the years after the War of 1812. Um, because by the 1820s, when Latin American countries are declaring their independence, um, the British foreign ministry is interested in coordinating foreign policy with us. And um, so, you know, each of these things is another signal that we are a stable country and capable of at least asserting our interests, if not actually um, defending them. Because even during most of the 19th century, and we talk about the Monroe Doctrine, you know, but the Monroe Doctrine was enforced by the, the British, not us. It was um, an attempt by the British to coordinate policy with us. And it's also a good example of unilateralism because they wanted to sign a memo with us. And we said, no, you do your policy, we'll do the same policy, but we're just gonna assert it separately. And that's what the Monroe Doctrine was. But the Monroe Doctrine um, was enforced by the British, not us, because we didn't have a Navy capable of, of um, enforcing the Monroe Doctrine in the Western Hemisphere, the British did. Okay, uh, Professor, you've jumped way ahead of me, which is awesome. Um, no, that's what I would expect from you to, you to do is to broaden the conversation. So thank you. Well, I only uh, went to the 1820s. I know, I know. But I'm going to jump and skip most of America's history now. I had the premise that you would give an excellent answer on why America is unique and important from 1776 to 1787, and you expanded it, and it was an awesome answer. Now, my next question is to skip the rest of American history and go from today back 11 years. What does United States foreign policy, what do we as America stand for now for the last 11 years, and it could be 13 years or whatever, but uh, 11 years, two years into President Obama's administration, eight, eight years, another four years of President Trump, and now a year of President Biden, that's 11 years. What does America stand for right now, telling the world and what the world, what we expect the world to think of us and how we wish them to behave. I'm not sure you can answer this, Professor. So I, I am so fascinated by how you're gonna answer this. What's America stand for? Um, the, Biden, the, the, the best, I mean, we're pretty early into the Biden administration, but I would say that the Biden administration's overall foreign policy outlook seems to be actually most in line with the last truly coherent foreign policy, which was under George W. Bush. Now, I know that this is going to seem strange to your many people, but it was that Bush was really the first reassertion of an anti-Wilsonian return to traditional American foreign policy of, of uh, American in, uh, exceptionalism and unilateralism. And it seems like Biden is... Um, returning to that. And I, I usually explain this to, in, in a very simple way. Um, we got a little bit sideways in foreign policy when the Wilson administration came in because after that and because of what happened during World War II, you had this, um, and the Cold War, like you had this impulse towards idealism in American foreign policy, um, but an idealism removed from interests. And it led to um, 
an idea that somehow the United States um, can and should intervene anywhere that a, um, you know, a, an, an unjust sparrow falls from the sky. And uh, it, it was really George W. Bush, before he came into office, who, who really had thought about it deeply about American foreign policy traditions pre-Wilson, uh, and um, mostly from his advisors digging so much into the McKinley administration, believe it or not, um, and really thinking about what American foreign policy could look like pre-Wilson again. And um, it, so it seems like Biden wants to return American foreign policy to being a policy based on ideals and interests. Now I'll say, I have no, Donald Trump's foreign policy was chaos. Um, whatever he rolled out of bed and said that day, uh, and anybody who said that they liked him it got, <laughs> You know, and I would also say it was uh, chaos and incompetence, not because of a just a lack of staffing and a lack of interest in getting people who, in positions who could even fill their jobs. And the Obama administration, their foreign policy was also likewise extremely chaotic and um, ever changing. I would say that by the time he left office, he had kind of, and this is why I think in some ways Biden is um, continuing in the broader American foreign policy tradition is because that's where Obama eventually got to. You know, it's kind of, I, I, I almost have the same feelings about Carter. If you ask if Carter was a good foreign policy president, no, but by 1980, he almost was, <laughs> you know, he had learned, he had made so many mistakes that by his second term, by what, by the time he left office, Carter was starting to make good decisions by 1980. Um, and Obama had made so many horrible mistakes. Um, that by the time he left office, he had learned a lot of those lessons. Um, and so uh, I would say it's because Obama was a, very bright and you know capable of learning and and he did learn a lot on the job um so i it, it's just a shame that we've had essentially 12 years of uh, complete chaos in foreign policy okay so you have answered my question now the last 13 years the average american i know you don't like left or right so let's say conservative or liberal or or, or republican or democratic or any of the what if we were just walk down my neighborhood or yours and say what's america stand for in foreign policy what do we believe in most of us couldn't give a cohesive answer today for the last 13 years correct i would say for at least the last 16 years the the most accurate answer i can give is presidential whim hmm okay so we, we found it on a country of noble ideals that most people kind of get. And I know we're in a battle royale um, in today's political terms of whether we're a, an evil, sin-filled founding country or whether we're a noble, interested, um, idealistic, wonderful country. I, I, that's an interesting juxtaposition that I wanted to imagine we're in. But we're, right now there's forces that are trying to present. And we've done a couple shows on that and we'll do more. But at least most folks realize that freedom and uh, private property and rule of law and lots of stuff in the founding of our country. And then we've kind of gotten astray somehow um, in the last 13 years. So we're on the same page? Yeah, and I'd say it's I, I, even further, one of the more interesting things is that almost every American voter votes for the president based on domestic policy. And that's an area where the president has almost no ability to influence policy. And, and they never vote for president based on foreign policy. And under our constitution, the president gets to virtually shape our entire foreign policy. It, and, and the U.S. Supreme Court have, has ruled that. That's not just your opinion, Professor. The U.S. Supreme Court has, for centuries, given awesome power to the president. Yes. I mean, they those are executive departments that answer all the way up and only to the president. Um, I mean, until the point where it becomes a treaty that, and then the Senate can get involved. But, and you know, and the House has oversight 
on certain activities, but uh, you know, but in terms of the policies and the actions of the United States with regards to the rest of the world, if I, I would tell your average voter, your first consideration in, in choosing a president should probably be foreign policy. And we barely talk about it at all. Right, almost never. Yeah, okay, so Professor, we have nine more minutes to talk about it. And then we have another half hour for anyone that's dialed in. Uh, so get ready for your questions and answers, especially you, Commissioner Jerky and Frank Lawrence's friend. Um, so um, Professor Tootle, this is lightning round just for me, nine questions. We don't even have, you can just say skip it if you wish, because um, I've answered, or you've asked my two big ones. Uh, first, are we a superpower? That could be a yes or no in a one line. Yes. yes, we are a global superpower by the nature of the size of our economy and the power of our military. Specifically, Navy, ability to put on land forces in the Army, Marines, and the ability to control space, Air Force, and Space Command, correct? I mean, just yes. we are just like a the ability total. To yeah, the ability to project power, and then also, you know, the, the latent power of our economy uh, is, is is also factored into our ability to project power abroad. But yeah, you're, we're the but you're right. Currency, the world. If we say something, people should probably pay attention to it. We got a carrot and a stick. We've got ideals, and we're sometimes mean. Well, it's also the reason why, if you want to really get dark, it's also the reason why we can go so deeply into debt because we're the reserve currency and we're doing things with our economy right now that we really shouldn't be able to do. And we're only getting away with it because it's in the interests of other countries not to let our economy collapse. Yeah, um, maybe we'll do a whole new show just on that. So the answer is we're uh, the loan um, superpower in the world by far. No, um, we talk about China, we talk about Russia, we talk about the European Union, emerging Africa or Brazil. It, it, it's, it's not even close. We are the lone superpower in the world. And I'm not talking arrogance or pride. I'm just talking factually, correct? I don't know. Um, by that measure, I would, I I, I'd probably put, I'd put, I'd put China and Britain into that category too. Um, of superpowers? Yeah, you know, Britain's economic power and diplomatic influence is so much greater. I, I, I mean, maybe put them as marginal, but, um, and the other one that I would watch very carefully is India. You know, there's absolutely no reason why India wouldn't be a, a global superpower in 20 years and, and surpass China even. So I, okay. I we would, um, India is, is definitely on the move. <laughs> Yeah, cool. And that, and I think the global rivalry between China and India, are, uh, that's going to be something to watch over the next 40 years. Good, but you're still not backing off, even though I tried to really push you. We are a superpower and the only one. Yes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, are we vulnerable? Yes. Talk to us a little bit about that. If we're this massive superpower militarily and economically and a beacon of liberty, and so on and so on and so on. Longest running constitutional republic in the history of the world and so on. Why are we vulnerable? Because all of the things that our power is predicated on is actually something, uh, um, it, 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 as Lincoln said, like something in back of these. Um, so, you know, it's easy to focus on aircraft carriers because that's the manifestation of American power. But what it is that makes it possible for us to have aircraft carriers is free institutions at home and a large growing functioning and stable um, free market economy. And so the biggest threat to us in foreign policy is ourselves, um, is our debt levels and the uh, weakening of democratic institutions. So if, if in a way you could see it as the, the flip side of American exceptionalism is that the greatest threat to us is that if we forget American exceptionalism, uh, that the source of our power is really in believing in the ideals of America, um, because all of those other things that we have, the financial system, the aircraft carriers, the, the nuclear uh, economony, the, 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 the just the overall size of the American economy, those things are all predicated on ideals. Um, so it's, it's the ideals that are uh, the most precious thing. 
Ah, God, I love that. That'll be a cut quote. We'll use it another time. Thank you. So now I'm going to show my naivety and, and try not to give really long answers because we want to get to other people's questions. I'm not sure when it happened. World War One and 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 during and the aftermath, or maybe it was before, or maybe it took till World War Two. So forgive my lack of, of history knowledge, but I just I just gave you the full extent of my high school education. When did the U.S. become the world superpower? Maybe against Russia. What 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 time frame was it? It wasn't before World One. It was some time in there. And at some point, Americans started to believe that we were pretty important to the world, not just doing our own thing, making a living, raising a family. At some point in there, we started to exert our U.S. foreign policy in a huge way. Tell us about it. Well, slavery was holding us back, essentially. And um, so until as long as the United States still had you know, a third of our country in a non-free economy, it was acting like a giant anchor around the economy of the United States. And, um, and then still, uh, you know, the legacy of slavery meant that it was a drag on our uh, overall national institutions well, as but well. What do you mean? Up till the Civil War, that was an anchor, and then no, plus no, but afterwards too, because the I mean, the South didn't convert to having a free market economy overnight. Um, it, they they still retained the trappings of slavery, just without the the name, for many years afterwards. So it was years or decades, d decades. Uh, up until -ish when? Well, there are two. I mean, World War I uh, led to a large out migration of workers out. Then you'd say World War II led to um, um, the and the Depression led to um, um, federal investment in infrastructure projects in the South that began the process of integrating the Southern economy into the United States. But that happened in the 1930s and early 40s. And then um, big investments in things like the space program, oil, uh, led to further, and that's what led to really the first widespread immigration into the South from the North. Uh, I'm sorry, from the North into the South. And then, um, and then the other, th and then once um, by the mid 70s, when you had the enforcement of civil rights laws, then it, and then that combined with the um, kind of stiffening of labor unions in the north meant that you began to see companies relocating out of northern industrial cities into first border states. Well, first it started a place like Indiana, but then after Indiana, a place like Kentucky and Tennessee, and then it, further into the south. Um, and um, so the full integration of the South into the American economy probably you wouldn't say happened until the 1980s or 90s. So, so when I say the legacy of slavery was a, you know, a, a, a drag on the American economy, we really don't see the full integration of the Southern economy into the rest of the United States until, I mean, again, 70s, 80s, 90s, wow. uh, 90, so, uh, so about 100 uh, years plus, at least 100 years plus, yeah. Professor, um, does, it, does it just shock you? Um, we know each other pretty well now. This is our 25th show. We've known each other for five years, blah, blah, blah. Does it just shock you that I am shocked by that answer? I would have no guess. I would put a zero dollars, not a penny on that, saying that we'd be talking about slavery, uh, slavery and Jim Crow and the... Uh, As far as it, your mic cut out. You got no volume. Put it in the chat, maybe. Uh, so the but the next part of your question was when did America become a superpower? Right, I can answer that. Uh, and um, uh, the answer is sometime in the 19th century, the economy of the North by itself essentially put us in a position to uh, be a power along with Great Britain. Probably by the turn of the century, we were, you know, in the mix with the top five um, uh, and economically probably tied with or surpassed Britain. 
World War I was the first assertion really of American power abroad into foreign policy with pretty terrible results outside of the Western hemisphere. Um, then um, 1920s saw a kind of return to traditional American foreign policy, but it really wasn't until World War II that the United States is the United States, the big only and global um, superpower um, in the world. Um, and uh, the legacy of World War II is really what is shape, shaped so much of um, how we view American foreign policy. Essentially, we had to tell ourselves, it's funny, like, uh, like we talk about the uses of history, or I don't know if this, I guess if we're being harsh, it's kind of a lie that we had to tell ourselves or felt like we had to tell ourselves um, about history to serve what people considered the greater political cause of um, post-World War II American foreign policy. So essentially American history kind of got rewritten um, because people wanted to prevent the next world war. And they thought, well, the only way to prevent the next world war is to have this thing called the United Nations. And so in order for the United Nations to be successful, we have to kind of tell a lie about the 1920s and teens and before. And the lie they have to tell was they had to pretend that the reason World War II happened was because America was an isolationist country and didn't support the League of Nations and that Woodrow Wilson had had this amazing idea for the League of Nations. And if only these short-sighted isolationists hadn't uh, wrecked the League of Nations, then World War II would have been prevented and therefore we should all support the United Nations. But none of that's true. Um, but it's kind of a lie we told ourselves. Um, in order uh, so, to ensure the success of the United Nations. So, so Professor, I think we, we, we need to do a whole new show just on that kind of topic, because that's new to me as well. I, I need to, now, not totally new. Uh, I mean, for my entire adult life, conservatives hate United Nations and this globalist policy and, and stuff, and liberals love it, and we need to save the planet and respect it. I mean, it, it kind of permeates everything in today's politics. So I get that. It's not like totally brand new. Um, but I think we should talk about that more. Agreed? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I've got to skip a couple questions just because I want to go to the our friends that have joined up. Anything you want to mention about Europe, Middle East, China, Russia, or Cuba? There, that's my last question. Well, I guess we, I, I thought we were going to talk about Cuba today. So, uh, um, uh, but um, it's important to have a bigger context. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the most important thing to understand is that because our foreign policy is directed by the president, that we had a foreign policy for many years that, that, uh, that keeps to a, a sort of general set of principles, really up until Woodrow Wilson. Um, Wilson introduces a different tradition, it's then rejected but then revived by Franklin Roosevelt. And then um, post-World War II, uh, it, you know, Truman does his best. Eisenhower is pretty stable and returns to the old way. Uh, Kennedy, much more aggressive. Johnson wants to return to the Rooseveltian tradition. Uh, Nixon is completely outside of anything else that we've ever done before, uh, it, almost a foreign policy by cynicism, then um, you could say Carter is incompetent idealism, but he learns his lesson. Um, Reagan in many ways was uh, um, um, uh, very stable in, in terms of uh, foreign policy during the Reagan and Bush years. Um, Clinton wanted to return to a more idealistic human rights-based policy, but uh, um, was kind of scared to uh, and um, made some errors <laughs> uh, th throughout his presidency. And, and he's kind of all, the, in a way, Clinton and Obama were very similar in that regard and that they were just kind of all over the map, you know, um, very much an ad hoc kind of foreign policy, but at least, um, you could say thoughtful and they would study before making a decision. And then the Trump administration was kind of ad hoc without 
um, without the book learning. Uh. <laughs> so how about relationship to those other major geographic parts of the world? I mean, do we want to talk about Europe or Africa or China or Russia or Cuba? I mean, are there some things that we as citizens should be really concentrating on right now? Yeah, well, I think the thing that we as citizens should be concentrating on is the democratic institutions here at home. Um, because, you know, you can't really change what other countries do. It, it, I, I would call this kind of like a, a, being in a relationship. You know, you can't, you can't change how people feel about you. All you can control is yourself. Um, and so generally speaking, I think that our foreign policy works at its best when we know what we believe in and we keep explaining it consistently. And um, other countries will respond accordingly, especially when that is stable, when that's a stable message, because you know we can't actually control what happens in Cuba. So what we should strive to be probably is the best version of ourselves um and do our best i mean because as a projection of of foreign policy really you stick by that yes huh because it means that that um other countries know what to expect from us and we are incentivizing we in a way think of it this way we're also incentivizing peace that way um we're we're saying to these the example I'll, I like to give is New Zealand. No American goes to bed at night fearing what New Zealand is going to do to us. Our, there is not, the, um, we now recognize that um, it is in our own security interests for other countries to be safe, prosperous, and free. And what we should want from other countries is for them to be safe and prosperous and free because every other country on earth that is safe and prosperous and free is no longer a threat to the United States in any way. So all we want is for other countries to be safe and prosperous and free. And that is what will keep America's <laughs> Americans safe and prosperous and free. So my we might ha we might have some like sheep growers <laughs> or sheep herders who are upset at the competition from New Zealand sheep, and we might have some trade negotiations with New Zealand to work out. But we don't go to bed at night worried about New Zealand attacking the United States. So, Professor, my last question is this: In my formative years, before I first was able to vote. I read a couple different little pamphlets and it, I don't think they were pure propaganda, but they were probably put out by the Reagan campaign or, or associates. And they were incredibly important to me. I just remember before graduating from high school, I, I, I bought it that we are a good people and we don't want authoritarian rule, putting the thumb on people economically or spiritually or emotionally we people thrive better in an environment where they can do what they want to do i i bought it hook line and sinker and now it's what 40 years later and i still buy it hook line and, and i know a lot of people didn't like reagan now and they don't like it then and they don't like him now but he also won the super majority we were going to beat communists down and that's why he got my vote i mean i i was i felt that way passionately as an 18 year old and i feel still to this day and now we eh, Communist China, communist Russia, I don't know, they're different countries, they do their own thing. And, and so I just kind of feel like we've totally lost our way from that time when I thought we had something, we had some noble mission to create freedom around the world. Answer that however you'd like to, then we'll go to everybody else. It's still in our interest to create freedom around the world. It, We're it, not doing it. Right. Okay. And that's, and that's a well, shame. Yeah, <laughs> right. thanks for expressing me. Um, okay. Um, again, thanks for all letting me come off the Colorado Trail looking like hell. Um, thanks for forgiving that. Commissioner Jerky, you're up first. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Uh, 
couple of quick points. Uh, for me, I, I think that uh, World War II signified the start of uh, superpower for, uh, for America. We had the bomb, we won World War II, we had the economy, blah, blah, blah. Just to me, that was truly the, the start of when we could be crowned king in a sense. Uh, that's just a point that I make. Um, the, the question I've got, I guess, has to do with Hamilton, something he said really early on. He negotiated for, uh, for peace, supposedly, with the, uh, with the Brits. And one book that I read on Hamilton suggested that he really led the, uh, the war effort at that end at Yorktown and fought like hell for two months and put the Brits in a position where negotiating for peace was a, a better prospect. And I, I guess I'd just like to have that uh, clear in my mind which was it, or was it some of both? That's it. Yes. You know, the British were a sophisticated global power. They understood that losing one battle or losing one war was not going to be the permanent status of the British Empire. And they fully expected the government of the United States to collapse. And during the years of the Articles of Confederation, we were collapsing. So in a way, all of that was happening just as they had predicted. So um, again, well, getting back to a point I already made, you know, we can't really control how other countries deal with us. We can only control ourselves. The British um, at many times had a very paternalistic view towards the United States. They would do these things, I mean, and they were almost comical in the way they would treat us, and they would be like patting us on the head like, don't worry, you'll figure this out eventually. I mean, the how we ended up with the Philippines is a good example of this. You know, the, the British, after the Spanish-American War, the, uh, the British didn't want the Germans to take it. They didn't want to give it back to the, to the Spanish. And they knew that eventually we would figure out that we had to take control of the Philippines. So they actually sent warships uh, to prevent, because the, the Germans had already landed ships in the Philippines to take the Philippines. And so the British actually sent warships there and then prevented their resupply and just kept repositioning their ships so that the Germans couldn't uh, resupply their troops and they were forced to withdraw them. And they were essentially forming an informal blockade around the Philippines until we figured out that we had to take the Philippines over. So like they had figured it out that, oh no, they just haven't figured it out that they're gonna end up controlling the Philippines yet. So let's just make sure that nobody takes over the Philippines until they figure it out, you know? So the, the British, or, you know, how we found the Zimmerman telegram you know, was, we didn't have any spy service, the British are the ones who discovered it. And they kept putting it in places where we would find it. Like we were children playing hide and seek, you know? And then eventually when we, cause we knew that if they gave it to it, they knew that if they gave it to us, we would assume it was a forgery. So we had to find it ourselves. So they just put it in places where we would find it. You know, like in a way they kind of treated us like children uh, um, sometimes. Fascinating. Professor, do you agree with uh, Senator and Commissioner uh, Bill yeah. Jerky, World um, War II as well? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with the atomic bomb and, and okay. the weakness of the British economy and everything. Yeah. You know, the, Europe is okay. in rubble. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad to know a layman and a senator slash commissioner plus a U.S. history prof uh, professor all are in agreement on something. Good. Um, uh, Frank, you or your friend, you're up. Um, so this seems quite simple. I mean, the, the, the keep to the basics, keep it simple, stupid, the, the have a two or three uh, uh, ide ideological uh, uh, basis on which you perform. Uh, th this is an explanation of what has happened. Yeah, thank you, Professor Toodle. My question is, how do we move from where we are right now? What is, the, what is one thing that we can do to inspire our leadership to refocus on, our, on the fundamentals, the, the ideology it, to, to inspire, to move on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on. Sure you do. You got <laughs> one, one thing, Professor Toodle, one thought. I mean, I would say, and this is, it keeps, many of our segments come back to this. The concrete thing that I would require is that go back, every state in the United States needs to go back, 
to their um, liberal arts, liberal studies degree and make sure that of two things. First, that everyone who gets a liberal arts, liberal studies degree, everyone who teaches school in America has to take history. And then I would go back to every single public college in America and make sure that at that college, the people teaching history are actually subject matter experts in political, diplomatic, and military history as their so, primary. Because right now what we have is we have schools staffed by people who don't study political, diplomatic, and military history, and nobody taking classes anyway. So, so I mean, so essentially political, professor. diplomatic, and military history haven't been taught in 40 years. So what professor, we... <laughs> professor you, you've said that. Um, three or four different shows. So people, we can pull out sound bites about that if you wish, but I challenge you on your answer. You, you and I have now done like 25 shows. We realize there's a problem in America. Now, how are just two guys going to do something about this to your question, Frank? And the answer is we're dedicating time to talk about all sorts of issues, kind of a library of things that people should really be thinking about. And, and, and I'm telling you, Professor, I, I want to really push you on this one. Um, the American Enterprise Institute, the most conservative, influential think tank in America, brought you and I to Washington for three days to do exactly what we're doing now five years later to take this out to society and say, we got to think. Uh, Frank, you're probably more conservative than I am. And, and Tony, you're more liberal than I am. But that doesn't mean that either the three of us are our enemies. And we have got to stop every time we see it on Facebook or Twitter, and not with enemies, not with strangers, with our loved ones, with a friend going, I hate you, Trump, or, or I hate you, Obama, or whoever they hate. We just, in fact, we're doing a show on this two weeks from now on friendship and collegiality. And uh, we, I, I, I'm telling you, Frank, that was an excellent question, but uh, Professor, I don't like your answer. We can't just go to high school and college and teach course. This is a war now. American citizens hate each other. And well, we, we have to stop this. No, they don't. It's like, I mean, the reason is cultural. And I mean, I can tell you, there's probably the, the, the source of it is probably the baby boom generation being so large that, that it altered um, kind of the calculus on listening to young people because we'd never had a generation that big before. And so um, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound very old manish, but you know, it, it, some of this might solve itself as the baby boomers go away. Oh God, die! <laughs> yeah, um, because um, we will go back to having a calculus based on generations that are more equivalent to one another um, um, and we don't know if culturally the damage has already been done uh, we're just going to shift to permanently being a culture that only listens to young people <laughs> uh, because, which seems like a recipe for failure um, but uh, um, or if we'll have a shift in our cultural values away from that but um, uh, these are all things to, the, I mean, no failure is complete until you have the collapse. So um, the cultural problems that we're identifying, I mean, I guess I'd say the bigger cultural problem is that we don't have a culture, uh, we do have a culture of Americans who are clamoring for political, diplomatic, and military history. And if you look at the best-selling book, history books, that's what they are. Uh, and you've got people who aren't even historians writing books now because historians aren't writing the books that people want to read. <laughs> um, so uh, it, the, it, be, because what people want to read is political, military, and diplomatic history. Um, and so there is clearly a cultural desire for those things, but that desire is not so great that it has permeated into elite institutions. And so I think we have a problem of elite institution, a cultural problem of elite institutions rejecting the idea of knowledge. Um, 
Well, knowledge and also um, lack of understanding of cultural norms. I mean, of just what people are thinking out there. And there, we know some people that are doing good work on that, but there is a complete disconnect between educated and, and just real people out there living their life. Um, but when seeking answers, here's the uh, maybe the cultural problem I'm trying to drive at, which is when seeking answers, people, we have incentivized, we've incentivized coming up with a new word for something. That is what gets you tenure. That's what gets you um, advancement. That's what gets you notice. You coin some new term that becomes the term. So we've incentivized these labels when in most cases, smart people have already thought about most of these issues before. Uh, we don't, and we don't even need new words. You just don't know that people have talked about this stuff before. I think that conversation I had with um, the other history professor a couple of weeks ago kind of illustrated that there are these people called historians who have been working on this stuff for years. And um, the problem is that it, it takes years and decades of study to answer these questions in a way that is authoritative. And um, we want to, you know, hang a, a prize around somebody who makes up a new word. Uh, that's the person who gets the attention, not the guy who wrote, not, and the same thing is happening in like uh, other fields of science in, 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 the, in uh, medicine. They, they, there's this problem of, of uh, uh, medical journals. <laughs> you get nothing for replicating the results of studies but you get notice for some study that shows a wacky result that gets repeated on the news. Um, and in social study, social sciences, it's even worse. But th the fact that this, that this is even a problem in hard, what were called hard sciences tells you just how big of a problem this is in the broader culture, that even in the hard sciences, they're recognizing that that a lot of the studies that come out can't be replicated because, and no one wants to replicate them. Everybody just wants the headline. Yeah, so Professor, we've already done a show on communications, history of communications. We've also done a show on the meaning of words. So clearly you and I know that this is an issue that Frank's raised, that even though a history professor, why are we doing a show on communications and the history of words? Uh, because it's it, the world's changing right underneath our feet and we got to do better. Frank, um, we're, we're almost over time already, but I want you to have one more bite at the apple. Do you or your friend have a, a quick question, uh, follow up on that? Or are you good? I, th you good? I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, cool. Right. Um, Jason or Jake, um, either of you um, often uh, ask a hardball question. It's time for you to jump in. Oh, Bart, they, have, they waited too long. So Bart, um, you're up. <laughs> okay, my question is really simple. Professor, you said that the history that I guess I was taught about um, the effects of isolationism, supposedly isolationism in the 1920s and the failure of the League of Nations, um, that what I was taught was kind of, I guess, basically a lie. What is the truth? What really happened during that period in maybe four or five sentences? I um, am reading um, Promised Land Crusader State right now. So, so you, will, you will get to this part of the book. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. So the uh, Wilson's foreign policy was thoroughly repudiated by almost everybody in the United States. Uh, he was considered a complete, total, and abject political failure. And the Treaty of Versailles was not defeated by, oh, it's funny, you got the book too. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles was not defeated by isolationists because there were very few isolationists. It was defeated by a coalition of people who had very good questions about this very bizarre treaty and its obligations and the effect it would have on American law. And then the idea that somehow America went into a period of isolationism is also not true because by every standard that would have been used at the time, the United States was more engaged with the world and with international diplomacy than any other country ever had been, maybe even including Great Britain, 
We were organizing international naval conferences on naval disarmament. We were uh, participating in all of the activities of the League of Nations, even though we weren't a member. We were participating in the League of Nations activities more than any member was participating. <laughs> Uh, we just didn't want the legal implications of membership affecting American law. And um, we were also the ones who made it possible for Germany to have, if they had so chosen, um, pay back the money that they, uh, uh, in war debts and war reparations. And so we were uh, using uh, formal and informal diplomacy with uh, financial institutions. So uh, the story that that Germany couldn't afford to pay back the uh, or to pay I shouldn't say pay back to pay back to pay those war debts is not true. They could have paid it, and we made it possible. And in fact, if they had taken the loans, you, you know how finance works. If you take a low interest loan and you put it in a bank earning simple interest, the amount of the payment was such that you would have actually made money. The government of Germany would have made money if, if they had paid off their re reparations. Yeah. So uh, it, it was not a financial decision that Germany made to not pay off the reparations payments. It was a political decision. And, it was, and, and there's nothing, nobody that was in the League of Nations did anything to present, prevent Hitler's rise to power. So the idea that somehow if we had, gone from being a participant to a member that that would have prevented Hitler from rising from, to power, also false. So almost every one of those, pro and we don't become an isolationist country really until the depression. And that's again, a political decision made by the American people because during an economic depression, the Americans have this kind of circle the wagons of mentality, which <laughs> forces politicians to usually do all of the things that would make a depression worse. So almost everything the American people want when there is an economic downturn are the things that would make the downturn worse. And that is what happened in American international finance during the early 1930s. And essentially, as uh, uh, Mr. Jerky said, it isn't until World War II that the example kind of breaks. But if you think about things like Vietnam, you know, we probably wouldn't have been in the Vietnam War um, and if the Vietnam War probably wouldn't have happened if we weren't trying to make the United Nations succeed. Because when Vietnam declared its independence from France, the American army was there applauding, you know. Um, they were playing the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, it wasn't until the French, we needed, the Fr we needed France to be more powerful than they really were in order to justify them being on the UN Security Council in order to make the UN work, you know? And so the interests of Vietnam kind of went by the wayside because the success of the United Nations was more important than our previous policy in places like Vietnam. So I, those are all things, yeah, as uh, Mr. Peterson just said in the chat, uh, Ho Chi Minh read the declaration, our declaration of independence when Vietnam declared their independence in 1945. They played the Star Spangled Banner and read our de Declaration of Independence. Um, so, because they were more scared about the Chinese. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, so anyway, um, these, these kinds of political calculations, they happen all the time. And I'd say also um, something that uh, Frank said reminded me, um, it seems simple on the surface when we say we want a reassertion of unilateralism and American exceptionalism, but understanding that that means a lot of complicated decisions are going to be made and we're gonna get it wrong all the time. Um, one of the things one of my historian buddies always said is that, uh, and I like this, was that once you start studying American presidents making diplomatic decisions, you realize that you probably would have made exactly the same decision if you had been given the same information that they had. And it, it, you get a lot less arrogant in saying this president was wrong. Once you see the information that, they're, that they are presented with, you find out that, wow, I might have done the same thing. Um, so hopefully the study of history can give you a little humility in that regard. So we're, we're already out of time, but as we often do, we're, we go a minute or two over. 
Um, I'm gonna, I've got one final question and you'll get the last bite at the apple, Professor. Jason or Jake, do either of you have a quick, quick question, a quick answer, Jake? So where do you see the future of American foreign policy now that the Biden administration has announced that we're pulling out of Afghanistan and we wanna pull out of Iraq all the way? So we're ending the 20 year war in the Middle East. What do you see our next step as being once we get done with the Middle East? I think Please. almost all of it depends on who is elected president next. I, I think it matters more who succeeds Biden. The, do we get stability or do we swing back into chaos? You know, because if, I mean, frankly, if that next president is, um, uh, uh, you know, John Thune or Mitt Romney or uh, uh, I, I'm trying to think of an establishment. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know about Hillary Clinton, but um, um, I'm trying to think of a good, solid establishment Democrat. You know, like Merrick Garland. <laughs> you know, current Attorney General, right? I, you, you, in some ways, I, I would, uh, I think who our next president is is going to determine if we. Um, if we descend back into chaos. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Did that satisfy you, Jake? Okay, interesting controversial statement actually that satisfies Jake. Jason, you're, you're controversial usually, but you're silent today, you okay? All right, I see you're okay. Uh, professor, let me end with this question. We spend 1% of our entire budget. Now it is a massive budget, so 1% ain't something to laugh at, uh, but on foreign policy, on the U.S. Department of State, on USAID, on, on influencing, influencing foreign countries in all sorts of different ways, in humanitarian efforts, uh, Zeta and AIDS, as well as trying to get countries to do what we want them to do. 1% uh, of our budget, and a lot of people don't like any of it. They don't like the money to Saudi Arabia, they don't like the money to Israel. They don't like the money to anywhere. They think we should care for poor people at home. And by the way, that's kind of across the board, conservative and liberals. Talk to us a little bit about our influencing the world and our values. Is that 1% about right probably? Or do we need a little bit more? Or do we need a little bit less? And I don't necessarily care about the money according to our debt and deficit, uh, deficit and debt. But, but are we, I mean, there's military and how the military, what takes 45% of our budget and, they, and we influence people that way too. But a lot less now after the- Right, yeah, two, that's true. <laughs> so, well, but, 25 talk, or 30, yes. Yeah, true. Uh, um, but talk to us about our influence. Is that a wise to spend all this money around the world on what we want people to do? It's a complete mixed bag. You almost have to go program by program. Some of them are fantastic and have had incredible results. I think one of the best things, and actually, uh, like you, we just mentioned the Biden administration, just getting back into the mode of trying to um, um, uh, engage in the development um, of infrastructure projects in, in developing countries. You know, that's the kind of thing that is um, usually, it, it, it ends up, making us money <laughs> and, uh, and but it does have an in initial investment cost so um uh, th that kind of stuff really uh, it, i would say is is good money to spend um, a follow-up question on that are you worried about china and their influence around the world on how they're well that's absolutely why i mean because china is engaging in the behavior that led to the you know, Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And in a way, they're doing to the rest of the world what the rest of the world did to them in the 19th century. They're using development um, in order to then take over uh, the policy. They become so influential in the economies of these developing nations that they take over de facto control of their foreign policy, and in some cases, their domestic policies. And so, I mean, this is a a tremendous threat to the peace and stability of the world. Um, it's a percent of U.S. budget on military is 3.4 percent. Uh, no, that can't be right. It's be well, seven. maybe it's of discretionary spending. Yeah. 
I don't know. I want to see that pie chart. <laughs> we'll do that. At, uh, uh, it's three point four percent of the gross. Everything's spent. If it's if it's discretionary, it's much much higher. But there's so much going out in in Social Security and Medicare and but it can't be that welfare well. programs. It's that big. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll we'll let's do some research and maybe we'll even do a whole show on that, Commissioner. But thank you. It can't be that small. Um, I, my Google search of discretionary spending for the for the military budget, it was fifty four percent of federal discretionary spending, which is a half of the overall. And then Commissioner's point is, yeah, but we're spending so much because of COVID that it shrinks it down. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Lots to talk about in that. I don't want to end on that because this is on foreign policy. But thank you, Commissioner. So um, last call, uh, Frank, are you sure your friend doesn't want to say something? Come on, you're a newcomer. All newcomers get to say something. Well, I don't, this might make this go longer, but my only question was you, you initiated this saying that prior to 2010, as if we had a, an organized foreign policy. And I, I wonder why you made that distinction. And along with that, I'm wondering about you know, what, what you saw our policy as being at that time compared to the just previous. just to my question yeah I, yeah I thought it was interesting and the only reason I, I was trying to stump Professor Tootle that between the founding of our country and the Constitution was 13 years and so for the last 13 years one year of or half a year of Biden eight years or four years of Trump and eight years of Obama's uh, six years of Obama do we have a national value? Do we have a, are we all rallying around something together? And so I thought it would just be an interesting juxtaposition to get people who watch this video in the future to go, that's true. I don't actually know what America stands for and what we're fighting for and what we believe in. So I was just trying to make a rhetorical, there's no magic about that 13 years. I was just trying to make a comparison that when we founded the country we believed in, and then, in my opinion, under Reagan, we believed in. But now, I don't know what we believe in. Maybe it's 50-50 believing in something. We should be better than that, is my only point. Does that satisfy you? Sure, yeah. OK, thanks for ahead. asking. Yeah. Professor Tootle, you get the last point. We're out, we're out of time, so tell us something, and we'll see you next Friday. Tell us something. Um, I, I would just say that you know we've overcome a decade and a half of chaos before. Uh, so I am hopeful that we will overcome a decade and a half of chaos again. Um, and uh, we have survived um, decades of misunderstanding of political, diplomatic, and military history before, and I am hopeful that we will overcome that yet again. Um, the worrisome thing, though, is um, the lack of belief in these things among elites. That is the thing that is new, interesting, and worrisome. Uh, and the uh, overall debt level um, the, combined with a, a lack of interest among elites in, uh, in that issue. Uh, so good news is we've, we've overcome worse. The bad news is we have some new wrinkles. Uh, so I have one last question, Professor. Um, who is our controversial, uh, controversial at least with liberals? I thought he was pretty remarkable. Um, our AEI guy, he wrote uh, Coming Apart and also like White Charles America. Murray. Who is it? Charles Murray. Charles Murray. Um, and we've both seen him several times personally. So at some point you should all read his book. Um, I, I, have, I see every single moment of my day, unless I'm just out trail running, people who have zero idea that 46% plus of Americans totally disagree with them. They have no idea. Uh, we are a completely not divided necessarily because we all want to have a job. We all want to have a family and we all want to have a neighborhood and we all want to be safe. And there's lots of things we can be unifying, but they have no idea that there's a bunch of liberals out there or there's a bunch of conservatives out there or a bunch of people that hate Trump or a bunch of people that love Trump or a bunch. Uh, it is fascinating to me. I see it every single day of people that are clueless on the rest of society. We should do better on that. And anything that you can think of, and Tony, you're the pro on this stuff, but anything we can think of that can create connections 
across and 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 Charles Murray says it's almost impossible because we didn't go to school, we don't live in the neighborhoods, we don't go to church together, we don't there's zero that we have connect we don't we're not in the same grocery stores together anymore. But do you have a response to that in 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 context of foreign policy? How do we be America again? Join something. And it almost doesn't matter what. You know, begin weekly participation in uh, and not just that, but like um, uh, incentivize uh, joining something. So, you know, if you're a member of Rotary uh, and young people don't think they need to join Rotary, uh, you know, do business with people from Rotary. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's it, one of the things that has been somewhat lost in the severing of these ties is that, um, younger people don't see the benefit of joining things um, in, in part because whatever, 86% of young people think that they're going to be a social media influencer, um, which means the, um, they don't see the benefit of being a, a participant in something instead of the leader of it. And so uh, I would say join something with other human beings where you see them and meet them and know them in person. And then don't quit when you have a single disagreement with somebody. Um, and that includes, you know, churches, <laughs> you know, uh, people find themselves because the easiest thing in the world to do is to just say, I disagree with this church on X political issue. So I'm just never going to come back. Um, and uh, the same is true of your rotary and your, uh, I, I actually looked it up to see if this still existed, but did, did was, was it you I was talking about Demolay with? I feel like it's one of you. One of you I was talking about Demolay, um, the, uh, um, the like junior Masons. And I, I had to look it up to see if they even still existed anymore as a, as a, uh, a character shaping institution. Um, and um, uh, join something and encourage other people to join something. Cool. So on that, that wasn't a gratuitous ask, but uh, for you folks that aren't aware, uh, we do have a YouTube channel. It's called Toodle Talks. Uh, we do all, also have a Facebook group. So if you want to engage with other people that occasionally join in with this, please join the Facebook group called, I think it's called Toodle Talks, but just send me a link. Um, and then you can always watch these if you're vacationing or not interested in the subject matter later. Um, we do, or we want to continue to do this. So professor, um, thank you for your time. Um, two weeks from now, we're going to uh, talk about um, joining something and connecting and friendships. And the lack of the average American, I think it is, has 1.3 friends. That means a ton of people have zero friends. And is that important? We're gonna talk about that. And so uh, please join us two weeks from now. We'll also have a show next week. I just haven't determined what it is yet. So um, hopefully it's more entertaining than um, some of our past shows, but hope you enjoyed today. Professor, great job. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you.